How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer just to make sure that we're spiritually prepared to study God's word and for spiritual growth. Uh, Scripture says, if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that you, <clears throat> you are the God who controls history, that you have declared the end from the beginning. You have laid out a plan and scope that will take place in human history as it unfolds. We will see the demonstration of your wisdom, your grace, your power, and above all, we will see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we are so thankful that we can come together this evening to be strengthened and encouraged by your word, recognizing that uh, despite the fact that there are people down through the ages who cry that the sky is falling and that everything is going to come to an end in some way or another, we know that things will end, but according to your plan and purpose, and that therefore we can relax in the turmoil that we see around us and we can keep our focus on our mission as believers to represent you, to be a witness to the cross, and to grow to spiritual maturity. Father, we pray that as we study your word this evening, again, we'll be impressed with its accuracy, its infallibility, and that we will come to a greater understanding of what will transpire in the future, that it may affect where we are today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, tonight we're going to skip over to Daniel 11. Skip over to Daniel chapter 11 to continue our study on the Antichrist. We've looked at Daniel 7, which gave us a framework through the uh, kingdom, the various manifestations of the kingdom of man. The bear represented the Babylonian Empire. Uh, the, um, excuse me, the <clears throat> lion, the winged lion represented the Babylonian Empire. The bear, lopsided bear, represented the Medo-Persian Empire. Then we had the four-headed leopard, the four-winged leopard representing the Greek Empire, the four heads representing the four divisions, the four kings that would come out of the one uh, kingdom established by Alexander the Great, the four wings indicating the speed with which its conquest occurred. That's replaced by this indescribable beast that has ten horns, and that represents both the historic Roman Empire and then its future manifestation as a ten-nation confederacy. Now, when you take that broad overview, and then lay it onto Daniel chapter 8, we get a little more specifics about the Antichrist, because in Daniel 8 we had a prophecy that was fulfilled in history, and it just focuses in on those uh, middle two kingdoms, the Persian kingdom and the Greek kingdom. In the first, in the first vision in Daniel 7, and the ten, horned, the ten horns of that final beast... There is a little horn that comes up that comes out of one of those ten horns. That indicates that its origin is within the old Roman Empire. In the eighth chapter, where you have the ram and the and the, and the goat, the um, the the picture of the of the Antichrist is indicated by the little horn that comes up there out of the out of one of those four horns the four horns represent the uh, kingdom that comes out of the of Alexander that's a focus on Greece so that it's it's the uh, goat with the long horn that's Alexander that's replaced by four horns and out of one of those comes this a little horn in Daniel 8, which is not the same little horn as in Daniel 7. It's a little horn that represents Antiochus Epiphanes. And in our study there, we saw that whole chapter merely is talking about the, the historic fulfillment 
of that kingdom of, of uh, Antiochus Epiphanes that was a type or a shadow or a picture of the future kingdom of the Antichrist. But that is not talking about the Antichrist anywhere in Daniel chapter in Daniel chapter 8. What we learn from there is that the origin of the Antichrist comes out of the old Roman Empire. He's not Syrian. He's not Greek in his origin. He is... Uh, related to the people in Daniel chapter 9, where we concluded last time, talking about the destruction of the temple in AD 70, that the people who destroy the temple are the people of the prince who is to come. And so if the people are Roman, and it really didn't matter what their ethnicity was within the Roman Empire, they're Roman. And yet I pointed out at the end of class last time, I listed the various uh, Roman divisions, the Roman legions that were in in Jerusalem at the time of the final assault and destruction of the temple, showing that they ultimately recruited from Greece, from Italy, even though uh, you have the historic reference in uh, Josephus and a historic reference in Tacitus, who wasn't even there, just had it by sort of hearsay, uh, that they were mostly Arabs and Syrians. Actually, they were... Uh, just a, a, there were Arabs and Syrians there, but there were also numerous, nu- numerous Europeans. So you can't base your biblical exegesis on a that kind of a historical, uh, historical reference. So that gave us a good look at the uh, origins of the Antichrist, his character. He is militarily powerful. He's arrogant. He's insolent. He is uh, very uh, bright. His intelligence is such that he is able to uh, solve great problems and riddles and difficulties. And then the text also says, but his power doesn't come from himself. It comes from someone else, which we would identify with Satan. He is going to be empowered by Satan. There is a demonic empowerment to the Antichrist, the first beast, and his kingdom. All of that leads us to now to the next chapter, next significant chapter, which is Daniel Daniel 11. So turn to Daniel 11 with me. And I'm not going to go through the whole chapter because the first 30, the first 34 verses, 35 verses, are a slightly more detailed look at the same history we've seen already in Daniel chapter 8 related to the two kingdoms of uh, the uh, Seleucids, who were in the Syria area to the north of Israel, and the Egyptians, who are to the south of, area, of um, Israel, the Ptolemies. And I want you to note that in starting in verse 2, we have this prophecy that looks, looks forward, and this has all been fulfilled. And Daniel says in verse 2, Now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. So he's already living in the beginning of the Persian Empire. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them, than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up against all the realm of Greece. And this is uh, identified as Xerxes, and he is the one who... Uh, invaded Greece. This is at the time of the Battle of Marathon. Uh, he's the first to invade Greece, and he angers the Greece, the Greeks. And so that stirs them up, and Alexander's invasion of Persian, conquest of Persian, is ultimately motivated by Xerxes' invasion of Greece. We come to verse 3, Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. That's Alexander. Verse 4, when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. Again, that's the division of the Greek empire among uh, Alexander's four generals. And it states, but not among his prosperity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. So it doesn't go to his children, his heirs, but it's split up among among his generals. Now, this chapter is written somewhere around 535 B.C., the fulfillment occurs some 200 years later, around 330 to 320 B.C., at the time of, of Alexander. That is, that is legitimate predictive prophecy, and is one of the great, and the details that come up from verse 5 down through verse 35, these next uh, 
the next 30 verses or so, give extraordinary detail ahead of time as to what takes place in the Syrian, the northern Seleucid Empire in that area. And that has meant that this chapter, Daniel chapter 11, is really one of the most attacked chapters in all of the Bible. And because the liberal mindset, the mindset that rejects Christianity and rejects any kind of real supernatural impact into uh, into the world, into history, cannot accept the idea of real predictive prophecy. And so uh, in order to justify their position, they have to argue that this is really written historically. It was written after the fact. It wasn't written by Daniel. It's written by somebody else. And it's written as history and not as prophecy. And so you always have to be careful, uh, even among some so-called Christians, those who have a liberal view of the Scriptures, a liberal view of God, reject uh, true, authentic uh, authentic prophecy. One other thing that you should note is that you have two major powers that are described between verse 5 and verse 35. And these are described as the king of the south and the king of the north. Now, some of you may have heard it said that the king of the north is Russia. The king of the north is not Russia, not in context. The king of the north is the Seleucid Empire. It is Syria. The king of the south is Egypt. And that is very clear from looking at all of the details of this particular, uh, this particular prophecy. So the king of the north, some people identify the king of the north here with the Gog and Magog invasion that occurs in Ezekiel chapter 38. But these are two separate, uh, two totally separate uh, incidents and events. The king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel 5 through 35 relates to this power struggle that occurred between the Seleucid Empire to the north of Israel and the Egyptian Ptolemaic Empire to the south of Israel. And we studied that history uh, somewhat superficially over the last uh, two or three lessons and saw that at the end of that period, the Seleucids gained dominion over, over Israel, and this leads to the rise of Antiochus the fourth called Epiphanes. And he is the one who is described in verses 29 down through 35. And we read there, at that appointed time he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be uh, like the former or the latter. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. And it's at this point that you have the uh, fact that the Rome, the Rome comes to uh, ally themselves and to back up the weak uh, Ptolemaic Empire. This is when uh, uh, Antiochus is forced to yield to Rome. This is when he has to backpedal out of Egypt. And so he goes back in anger to attack and to destroy uh, in Israel. Uh, The end of verse 30 says, So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. He is going to honor those who are anti-Israel, who those among the Jews who have become Hellenized. And then verse 31, uh, Forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. That is the abomination of desolation that occurred in uh, approximately uh, 165 B.C., when he uh, sacrificed a pig on the altar and and rededicated the temple to the worship worship of Zeus. Uh, Verse 31 goes on to say, Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Verse 32, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. He'll praise them, he'll honor them, put them in positions of power. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Great exploits isn't in the original, but the implication is there. This is a reference to the Maccabean revolt that we talked about, the establishment of the Hasmonean Empire. Those who trusted in God uh, restored Israel, revolted against uh, the tyranny of Antiochus Epiphanes. In verse 33 we read, And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, 
Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. That was the uh, battles that occurred between the forces of Antiochus and the uh, Maccabees. And then verse 34, Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end. Now what's happened? Right there, you get a time phrase, until the time uh, of the end, because it is still uh, for the appointed time. And at that, verse 35, a shift begins to occur to take our attention forward to a, a future fulfillment. Now, verse 36 goes to say, Then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods, and he will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. So the phrase, until the indignation is finished, really takes us into the future. There is a gap between... Uh, verse 35 and verse 36, a time gap. This is not unusual in the Scriptures. There are many different uh, prophetic gaps that occur in many different passages uh, within, within the Bible. As you go from one verse to another, there's actually a, a huge gap in between. This is usually depicted by a chart, something like this, that I've seen, saw it in Clarence Larkin's a book on dispensationalism that came out in about 1916, and I'm sure it was not original with him. The idea that there that the prophets only saw certain high points of events; they didn't see everything, and there were a lot of events that would occur between these main uh, main future historical events that would be left out of their vision. For example, at this uh, this first mountain peak. There's the prophecy about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, indication of a star, Numbers 24.17. So they saw the birth of Jesus. They saw the cross, uh, the death of Christ, passages like Isaiah chapter 53, but they didn't have a lot to say about his childhood and other uh, intervening events. Then there's no mention in the Old Testament at all about the valley that comes between the uh, death of Christ and the end-time prophecy. This is the church age. It was unseen by the Old Testament prophets. And then you have the rise of the Antichrist, Daniel chapter 7, uh, 19 to 27. You see other passages like Daniel chapter 11 that indicate that. And then there's other things that are left out, some that are filled in by, by the book of Revelation. And so... There are certain key events that are prophesied in the Old Testament, but many other things that are uh, that are left out. And so we have these prophetic uh, gaps that are spoken of in the Old Testament that uh, give us a little uh, little pause here. For example, I've got a list here, and and this is typical in Daniel. Uh, You may want to note these and look at them at a later time. In the prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, which relates to the the vision of the the statue, there is a break between uh, Daniel 2.40 and Daniel 2.41. It reads like a continuous event, but there is a break that occurs in time between those two verses. In Daniel chapter 7, there's a break between 7.23, which is the early manifestation of of the Roman Empire, and verse 24, which is talking about the end-time manifestation of it. In Daniel 9, 26, there's a break between verse 26 and verse 27. Verse 26 is talking about the first advent. Uh, verse 27, talking about the final seven, uh, seven weeks of Daniel, the seven-day or the seven-year uh, seven period in the, uh, in the tribulation period. Daniel's 70th week, that's in verse 27, so there's a break there. In Daniel 11, there's a break between 11.34 and 35. In other passages, you have uh, similar breaks like Hosea 3, verse 4, breaks before verse 5. Psalm 22, 22, 
uh, breaks before verse 23. Isaiah 61 between ver- the first part of verse 2 and the second part of verse 2. And so this is not uncommon to see this take place in Scripture where the writer just sees things as if they're they're um, brought together in one continual flow without seeing certain uh, intervening uh, intervening events. So we have this split that occurs between uh, 36 and 37. Now when we come to verse 36, we have to ask the question, who is being discussed here in terms of the king? Up until this point, whenever you have Uh, the term king used, it is referred to as either the king of the south or the king of the north. And it's clear in context who is being discussed. But suddenly in verse 36, the geographical location disappears. You don't read of the king, uh, king of the north, king of the south, uh, in verse 36, but you will... uh, a little further down, when we get down to verse 40, we'll come back to a reference of the king of the south shall attack him, which is the king we're talking about in verse uh, verse 36. And the king of the north shall come against him. That, again, is the, is the king that is mentioned in verse 36. So we have th- really three kings mentioned in Daniel chapter 11. The, his, the king of the north the king of the south, and then this other king that shows up in verse 36. We also have this time gap so that the first 35 verses are historically fulfilled. And here we have the king of the north, which historically we know to be uh, Syria. That was the Seleucid Empire. And historically, we know the king of the south was Egypt. That was the Ptolemaic Empire. Well, when we get into the prophetic section... And in verse 40, when it says, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, meaning this third king. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots. The king of the south and the king of the north must be understood within their original historic reference. If they're the king of the north is Syria in the historic fulfillment, the king of the north in the future fulfillment, must also come out of that area of Syria. In the historic fulfillment, the king of the south was Egypt. So in the future fulfillment, the king of the south is also Egypt. The king of the north is not Russia. The king of the south is not just a general pan-Arabic bloc because some of those elements have already been destroyed by the final stages of the Battle of Armageddon. Hold your place here in Daniel chapter 11 and just turn back one book to Ezekiel, and we're just going to briefly look at Ezekiel uh, 37. Now, there's a lot of problems with Ezekiel 37, 38, and I'm not going to get into all of those, but I do want to point out the nations that are involved in this particular assault on Israel. I believe that uh, from my study to this point that this I still take the position that the this assault takes place near the end of the second half of the tribulation. I've mentioned this before that there are four different views on the timing of this invasion of Gog and Magog against Israel. The the least held view is that this is talking about the Gog invasion that occurs at the end of the Millennial Kingdom that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. This, I don't, this is not that event at all. This is a completely different event. One view, which is a view that Arnold Fruchtenbaum takes, and Arnold takes a view that because there has to be a certain amount of time to cleanse the land... Uh, after this battle before the kingdom can be established, then this ha- it takes seven years to cl- cl- cleanse the land. So this has to come before the tribulation begins, and probably between the period of the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. There are others. Mark Hitchcock, who uh, comes to pre-trib all the time, uh, is a also teaches at Dallas uh, Seminary. 
Uh, now, I think Ike's had him for a couple of courses. He's pastor of a church up uh, north of Oklahoma City, and he presented a paper a couple of years ago, and he argued the same position that Dr. Walbert argued for, and that is that this battle occurs in the first half of the tribulation, early in the first part, at, probably as part of the wars mentioned as the second seal. So that's, uh, that's the third view. The fourth view is a view that uh, I believe was taken by Dr. Chafer. Uh, Pastor Thiem took this view. A number of others have taken this view. I think Hal Lindsey took this view at one point. I'm not sure where he is on that today. But a number of others take the view that this occurs towards the second half of the last half of the tribulation, about three-quarters of the way through the tribulation, as one of the initial uh, events in the, uh, in the battle uh, in the campaign for Armageddon. That is a view that I have uh, taught in the past and have not seen a strong reason to uh, turn away from it, but this is one of, the view, one of the issues that a lot of people just wrestle with because there really isn't a tremendous amount of uh, temporal data here to hang your, hang your hat on. The Jews are living in unwalled villages. They're at peace. Well, that could be first half of the tribulation, and they're taken by surprise. Other things are going on. Um, uh, so that uh, just, I'm not even going to get into that tonight. I just want to point out who's involved in this. In verse 2 of Ezekiel 38, 2, we read, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. Now, historically, this area was the area up around, uh, the, up around the Black Sea. Uh, the area which is modern uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan, between the Black Sea and um, uh, what's the uh, Caspian Sea, the area of northwestern northern Turkey on up in those areas, that was the area of the land of Magog. The Prince of Rosh, some have taken that back to uh, at, at being etymologically related to the root for Russia, Meshach, etymologically related to the root for Moscow. I don't know how accurate those are, but these have historic meaning, and they would come from that far northern area around the Black Sea and north of there. And so that is understood to be Russia. But in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that it, they're never referred to as the king of the north. Now, there's some people who just who think that. I remember getting in a discussion with somebody about this not long ago. It may have been somebody at the church, and I said, oh, just look it up. You will not find the phrase king of the north in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And they were so surprised. They were just convinced that, that was, this was the king of the north, but it's not. It is a, this is a distinct invasion event from uh, Daniel chapter 11. So we have Gog from the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and verse 3, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, the great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And then look who the allies are. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Now, that's another interesting fact because today, for the first time in many, many years, uh, if not centuries, you have alliances taking place and you have Russia cozying up to, uh, to Iran, to Persia. This is the first time that's happened in, in, in centuries. And so this seems to be setting the stage for something like this. This is why you have people like Joel Rosenberg, and uh, th who wrote the epicenter, and he has a new book out called Inside the Revolution, which is ab about the how the, revolu the <clears throat> revolution took place with the radicals under Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran in the late 70s, and how that radical Islamic revolution has now been exported to these other Islamic countries, such as Syria and Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and and how they are stirring up trouble. He, interestingly enough, uh, Joel had Joel is a uh, he's ethnically Jewish. He became a believer at some point uh, in his life several decades ago by now, and he is uh, he's taken this 
this book, Inside the Revolution, turned it into a documentary that is going to be released on September 11th, and they're also having a online town hall type of meeting, and we're looking into, and they want to live stream this into various churches around the country, and we're uh, looking at that event as a possibility for our September family night, and then we can see, they're, they're going to show about maybe an hour's worth, 40 minutes worth of the documentary, and then have um, discussion. So we're looking into that right now. But he takes the view that, like Arnold does, that this is very early. This may precede the uh, tribulation. So these things are kind of important to understand as you listen to different people talk about those events in biblical prophecy so you understand where they're coming from, and we can all we can all learn. But this is an interesting uh alliance here that is described in Ezekiel 38. In the north you have Russia, possibly Turkey. In the south you have Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. There's also an alliance with Gomer. Now where's Gomer? Gomer is the historic background, the historic antecedent for the uh, Western Europeans, the Germans. In many languages you get a when you move from one language to another, you'll, you'll sometimes have consonants switch places. So G-M-R, when you reverse M and R, you have G-R-M, which becomes the root of Germany. You have a, 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 there's a lot of other uh, historic ties to that, uh, to, from Germany. There's a Lake Ashkenaz up in Germany. Uh, these things all connect together. It's very uh, interesting to go through the details of this, but it seems to be a Western European uh, Russian uh, alliance with uh, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. That's not the same. And all I want to do there and by referencing that is just to make the point that that's a different alliance of nations than what we have in Daniel chapter 11. So these are two different uh, different events. And I believe that the events that occur in that are described here in verses 40 to 45 of Daniel 11 are going to take place during the heart of the campaign of Armageddon as the Antichrist moves his armies into, into the Middle East in order to solve uh, these problems and to uh, shore up his own authority uh, in the world that's begun to fragment He's going to uh, move his base of operations there, I believe, to the Armageddon Valley, to the Valley of Jezreel. And then while he is there, this is when he's going to be attacked. And if you notice the prepos- I mean, the pronouns here, it's he that is being attacked, not Israel. So you're going to have this assault on him from the Syrians and the Egyptians in order to wipe him out. There, they end up getting defeated, but I believe that it's right after that that Babylon will be destroyed. And we're going to see how all these different things come together in the Battle of Armageddon. But right now, we're just looking at the, um, these events as they relate to the career and character of the Antichrist. So verse 36 says, this king will do as he pleases. He's different from... Antiochus Epiphanes, he is similar in that he is incredibly arrogant, but there are also uh, several distinctions. And as we look at the, the, the descriptions that are given of this king, they don't fit the historical events that occurred with uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. So we remember that this king is not identified as a king of the north or king of the south, but he is uh, very different. Now, remember, uh, uh, not just uh, earlier, we didn't look at that, but remember we had Antiochus indicated as a willful king in Daniel chapter 8. Here in Daniel 11, 21, he's called a vile person. In his place shall arise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably, seize the kingdom uh, by intrigue. So he is a vile person. He sends forces to desecrate the sanctuary in verse 31. In verse uh, 36, we have a shift to the future person who is monstrous, 
and he's going to establish his palace at the place of the sanctuary, which is indicated in verse 44. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, that's the temple mount, and yet he shall come to his end, no one no one will help him. Well, it's the Antichrist who uh, establishes his tent, his armies, his palace there uh, on the Temple Mount. So all of this is related to the Antichrist, not uh, historically fulfilled in Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, second point we ought to make in terms of a contrast between Antiochus and this king is that Antiochus worshipped the Greek gods, he imposed Greek culture on the Jews. We talked about the culture wars and how he's in trying to impose Greek thought on the Jews and to separate them from their uh, religious past. So he had great regard for the religion of his fathers, his ancestors. He was Greek, and he honored his uh, Greek an uh, an ancestors. So when we come to 1137, which says, "...he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers." or for the desire of women, that's a different phrase to look at. One of the things that we see here is that the future king has no regard for the gods of his ancestors, but Antiochus did. So that's another contrast between the king of the, of the north and this king. Antiochus accepted the daughters of women. He was married uh, several times. This was part of his... Uh, life, but the desire of women is stated to not be in uh, in the Antichrist. The this other king, verse thirty seven, states that uh, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above all of them. So this brings up an, another interesting. Uh, another interesting exegetical problem that really uh, has confused a lot of people. Some think that this means, well, is he homosexual? No, I don't think that's what this means. Um, it means that uh, the most likely occurrences are one of two. First is that he is so focused on his mission, he is so self-absorbed and single-minded that he is just not at all concerned with marriage or with having a family or normal human uh, relationships. And that is, that is a possible interpretation. The second interpretation is that the phrase desire of women, and that word desire is used only a couple of other times in the Hebrew Old Testament, and in those other uses, it is related to, uh, it is related to the desire of Israel, who is the Messiah. And so it is thought that this is an allusion then to, uh, to the desire that women would have to be the mother of the Messiah. And so this is sort of a circumlocution for, for, as a reference to the, uh, to, the, to the Messiah, the birth of the Messiah. And so what it would be saying then is he has no regard for the Messiah. He has no regard for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Hebrew word that is used here is hetmedah, hetmedah, and it is not a desire for women. It indicates a desire that women have. It's used in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 9.20 in a context similar to Daniel 11.37. There it's used for the desire of Israel. Who is it that Israel desired? They desire to see their uh, their Messiah. In Haggai 2.7, the uh, word is also used there in a similar context, for the desire of the nations will come, meaning the Messiah will come. And so I think there's a very strong case here that this is a messianic code word to indicate that uh, he will show no desire whatsoever for uh, the Messiah. Now that makes sense in context. What's the context talking about? He'll show no regard for the gods of his fathers. They're not. It's not the God of his fathers. Not he's not Jewish. It's Elohim, a plural. But in many case times Elohim has not the sense of God in terms of the plural of the Trinitarian plural, but in the sense of gods, 
uh, a pantheon, a pantheon of gods. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, that is, the promised Messiah to Israel, nor will he show regard for any other god. So you have three things mentioned here. The first has to do with gods. The third has to do with gods. To say that the middle term there, the desire for women, it is a non-religious reference. He's just not interested in a family life. Doesn't fit with the first description and the third description. So if the middle term is understood and it's supported by the word usage to be a, the Messiah, then all three terms indicate that his hostility and arrogance against uh, Christianity, against any religion other than his own religion, setting himself up to be worshipped as uh, to be worshipped as God. So, so we go forward and look at verse. Uh, let me see, verse thirty. Eight, I don't have that one on the screen. 30, 30, verse 38 reinforces this. In their place, that in the place of the historic ancestral gods of his ethnic background, which could be Europe, it could be uh, any anything related to that. Uh, it could be Christianity, if he's European, it's very likely. But in their place, he shall honor a god of fortresses, a god of strength, military strength. So he worships military power and military conquest. In their place he shall honor a god of fortresses, and a god which his fathers did not know he shall honor with gold and silver. This god which they did not know, I believe, is a reference to Satan. Satan is the real power behind the Antichrist, and so that is whom he he worships, and that is who he gives all honor to. Then we come to verse uh, 39. We read, and he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god. This, again, I think emphasizes this strange god, this uh, god that is not part of the pantheon. This god would be Satan. With the help of this other power, he is able to defeat all of his enemies. And he will give great honor to those who acknowledge him, and he will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for price. So this is just describing how he rewards uh, everyone who helped put him in a place of power. This is typical of most politicians. We see it every time uh, Every time a new president comes in. He starts to uh, give out certain political uh, positions as rewards to those who have been loyal to him and those who have worked hard on his campaign and those whom he trusts. Uh, depending on the character and the integrity of the president, uh, this can affect the quality of those appointments. Now, we come then to verse 40. We see this shift continue to take place related to the future. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north will come against him like a whirlwind. So this indicates, a whirlwind indicates not only surprise, suddenness, but also power. And so there is a powerful assault against him to stop him because it's very likely it's that Syria and Egypt are, they may have been, I mean, I'm just speculating here, you can't be certain, but they could be three of those nations, the original ten nations, Remember, the little horn comes up in the midst of those ten horns, and he conquers, he pulls three of them out by the root. It's possible that these could be part of that uh, original ten-nation confederacy, but he had had attacked them initially, and now they uh, are attacking him. They see the opportunity to catch him in a pincer movement between uh, Syria in the north and Egypt in the south, and to... Uh, to destroy him, I, uh, you know, we're just not clear on some of these uh, particulars. So the king of the north, king of the south, come against him with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And people say, "Well, what, what does this mean?" Or, or, and you, you, if you've read *Late Great Planet Earth* or Hal Lindsey or some others, they've said that, "Well, this is just uh, ancient writers writing in terms of their own frame of reference." Chariots could be tanks; they could be. Uh, assault, uh, you know, Bradley assault vehicles, other things of this type. 
And I believe that, th- that when it comes to the end times, these are going to be primitive weapons. They will be shooting bows and arrows. They will be riding horses and chariots. Because when you look at all of the destruction that occurs in the first 75% of the tribulation period, in that first three, three quarters, roughly five and a half to six years, There is such an assault on the ecosystems of the earth. There's a couple of asteroid showers, all these things that take place. A quarter of the seas turn to blood, a third of the shipping uh, is destroyed, and about 90% of all trade, everything that that is traded between nations goes on the oceans. Isn't that amazing? 90% of all trade today is is carried over the ocean. So if you wipe out a third of the shipping, you basically wipe out uh, international commerce in this world. And about, what was it, Alan, about 90% or 85% of all data that is transferred, transference of money, all, all data that is sent over, over cables and over wires travels on underwater cables that we have put laid down underneath all of the oceans. And so these are going to be disrupted by earthquakes and tidal waves and all these things that come come to pass. And with these massive asteroid showers that hit the earth and the burning star that hits the earth, I believe that the entire uh, electrical grid on the planet is pretty much uh, wiped out. It uh, just doesn't work anymore. So man is thrown back into a much more primitive technology than we currently have. When you look at how computerized all of our weapon system ha- systems have become, and if you wipe out the electronics and the computerization, we're not flying, we're not uh, going over the oceans, we're not, uh, our tanks are dead uh, where they sit, uh, oil cannot be uh, refined and then moved to markets. All of this is wiped out. So, I think there really will be a return to a much more primitive, violent form of warfare. So we read in verse 41, He, meaning the Antichrist, shall enter into the glorious land, that's Israel, and many countries will be overthrown. So this is a generalized description of his of his conquest, and the result of that is that he's going to conquer many countries and destroy them. But he says, Then these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Now, where is Ammon? This is indicated by the modern city of Amman, Jordan. In fact, these three terms represent uh, most of what is now the modern uh, Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Moab and Ammon. Remember, these were the uh, two sons, in, uh, two sons of Lot, as a result of the incest uh, committed by his daughters when they got him drunk, and so they are first cousins to Israel. So they are going to escape. Uh, that is part of God's blessing on them, as well as Edom, which is a descendant of Esau. Esau ate the porridge. Edom means red. Um, this is uh, he was redheaded. This is the uh, reference to to the descendants of Esau. So Edom, Moab, and Ammon are delivered. And of course, in um, the area of Jordan is where Petra is located. The area of Basra, which is where the uh, remnant of Israel will flee for protection down in that horrendous, horrendous um, wilderness. Verse 42, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries and against the land of, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So this is when you have this assault on Egypt. Egypt is not part of that alliance that occurs in Ezekiel 38 and 39. This passage describes is one of a couple of passages that describes the destruction of Egypt. Verse 43, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. That's a term for uh, they've been conquered by him, and that happened sometime previously. First mention of them in this passage. This is one passage, perhaps, that indicates that the, the defeat of Libya and Ethiopia as allies to the Gog and Magog invasion that that occurs late rather than 
early. Uh, verse 44, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Now, the news from the east is when he hears that Babylon is destroyed. News from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. I think this is basically a summation of what will take place uh, at the battle of the campaign of Armageddon during the last half of the last half of the of the tribulation period. So what we see here in terms of understanding the character of the Antichrist are a number of things. He ha- he is arrogant. He has n- he exalts himself. He has no regard for any other religious system. He is blasphemous toward the God of gods. He d- as uh, uh, he gets his real power from Satan, and he worships Satan. So there is a strong religious uh, uh, focus in his empire, but it's all on it's all on Satan. Now that takes us out of the Old Testament, takes us into the New Testament. We still have a little time left, so turn in your Bibles to Second Thessalonians. All the books in the New Testament that start with T are found together. There's five of them. First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and Titus. So whenever you find a book, have a book that starts with a T, they're all located right together. Isn't that nice? That makes it easy for you to find things. Second Thessalonians chapter two is the key chapter in the, other than Revelation thirteen, Second uh, Thess two is a key chapter dealing with the, dealing with the old uh, the Antichrist in the New Testament. Now, verse 1 reads, Now, brethren, Paul is addressing those in the church at Thessalonica concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Now, he's talking about the rapture. The hour there is talking about the church. This isn't talking about Israel. This isn't talking about uh, just believers in general. It's talking about the, the rapture. He's clearly described the rapture for them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And uh, here again, he says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be so soon shaken in mind or troubled. That was a problem was people were coming along and said Jesus had already come back. Uh, so they had preterists in their day just as they do now. And uh, not to be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ, that's a term for the tribulation, had already come. And then we come to verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, it, what is it? The day of Christ, the tribulation. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Now, that's a, that is a coward's translation. Whenever you take a word in another language and just transliterate it instead of translate it, that is a uh, that, that's the easy way out, and you don't have to um, you don't have to decide what it means. The original word in the Greek looks very similar to the English word. It's apostasia, apostasia, and we think of apostasy as a very limited thing: is falling away from the truth, getting into false teaching, and so. But that is not necessarily the meaning here. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, that is, the day of Christ, will not come unless the apostasia comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So before the day of Christ occurs, which is uh, related to the tribulation and the ultimate return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the second coming, that that won't occur until something called the apostasia happens and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now, the term man of lawlessness is a term related to the Antichrist, also called the son of destruction. But what I want to focus on in just the last last few minutes we have tonight is on what is this word apostasia? Does it refer to defection, falling away from the truth, or does it refer to something else? 
Well, some, many people, many scholars have believed that this refers to a, a great end times falling away from the truth, great end times apostasy that must come first before Jesus will return at the rapture. The problem with that is if the rapture is a signless, imminent event, then that means that nothing has to precede it. It could happen at any time. There, should, there does not need to be anything uh, between us and the return of the Lord. We're not looking for the apostasy. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. So that's the issue. Now, the word apostasia has as its root meaning the idea of departure. Departure. Now, it's, the, the noun is, this noun is only used about three times in the New Testament, and it has that idea of defection. But the, the verb, which is opistemi, is used about 15 times in the New Testament, and it is more clearly used to refer to uh, departure, the idea of something leaving. It's used of ships leaving the harbor, somebody departing on a trip, things of that nature. Historically, that has been how this word has been understood. For example, the Vulgate, which was Jerome's translation of the Hebrew Old Testament and Greek New Testament into Latin, which took place in the 3rd century B.C. He sat in the Church of the, um, church of the Incarnation there in, um, in Bethlehem, where Jesus, was, uh, where Jesus was born, and he sat there and translated the Hebrew Old Testament, Greek New Testament into, into, um, into Latin. And he chose the uh, Latin verb decesso, meaning departure, discesso, meaning departure. In 1384, when Wycliffe, one of the, the morning star of the uh, Protestant Reformation, the English Reformation, when he translated uh, the Greek into English, he translated the, when the, the departing must come first. He spelled that D-E-P-A-R-T-Y-N-G-E, the departing. The departing was first. It's departure. He doesn't translate it as, as heresy. Tyndale, in 1526, translated it as departing. In 1535, Miles Coverdale in the Coverdale Bible translated it departing. In 1539, Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury in the Cranmer Bible, it's translated departing first. In the 1576 Breaches Bible, which was just one, uh, one very, they called the Breaches Bible because Adam and Eve did not cover themselves with fig leaves. They covered themselves with breeches. They made breeches out of fig leaves, so they called the Breaches Bible. In the Breaches Bible, it was uh, translated departing first. In the 1583 edition of the Beza Bible, it's translated departing first. In the 1608 Geneva Bible, it's translated departing first. And it's not until the 1611 Authorized Version King James Bible that you have an English Bible translated falling away or in the sense of apostasy. So uh, this then has shaped, the translation of the King James has shaped all subsequent English translations that want to take this in the sense of uh, departure from the, from the truth, departure from... Uh, orthodoxy. But if we go back to uh, the original, earliest understanding of this word, which has solid lexical support, and a number of scholars, not nearly the majority, but a number of scholars understand it this way, it should be translated that, that the day of Christ, the return of Christ, preceded by the events of the tribulation, the day of Christ will not come until the departure comes first, that is, the departure of the church. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. That comes after the departure of the church, the son of destruction. Now, next time we'll come back and start in Second Thessalonians 2, 4 and go through the remainder of this chapter down through about verse uh, 12 in order to see what this passage teaches us about the Antichrist and then 
armed with this solid background we've had all summer long in looking at these passages in Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Daniel 11, and 2 Thess 2, we will then get back into Revelation 13, and we ought to be able to move fairly quickly because we now have a good understanding of all the things said about the first beast there because we understand the Old Testament frame of reference. So we'll come back and start there next time. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things this evening, to be encouraged by the fact that you have outlined human history. We know what will come to pass in the future. Now we are in a period where there is no prophecy fulfilled, but it is a time where we are uh, definitely waiting for you, looking for you, anticipating your coming, but we recognize that we still have a mission, and that mission is to communicate the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to everyone that we come with whom we come into contact. Father, we pray that you would challenge us and comfort us with the things we've studied this evening. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.